Let us do battle in faith and with faithfulness and looking to that day of the ultimate kingdom. Know the Holy Spirit is preparing us for kingdom victories today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time and the second message, Lord. The second part of this message of longing for Zion in a foreign land. Heavenly Father, as we continue in this second part of this message, we ask that not by power, not by might, but by your Holy Spirit. You speak to us tenderly, lovingly, caringly, bringing us back into not only your eternal covenantal plan and redemptive purposes, but the restoration that you have for us for eternity. We give you praise and thanks in the holy and precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be opening up the second part of this message with the kingdom dynamic, which um, is the, the declaration of the ultimate victory in Christ. And then this sets the tone for the second part of this message, because the first part was speaking about the proclamations against Babylon, against the, um, the, 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 the enemies of not only Israel, but maybe the enemies in our own lives. Perhaps maybe bringing us into right relationship, worshipping the one true God, allowing for the healing of the disease that may be plaguing us, or perhaps more worrying us for the uncertain future, or perhaps maybe healing us from a loss of a loved one. This is the power and the promise of God's word. There is no greater biblical declaration of faith's confession. Those facing the cataclysmic travail of the last days endure it with constant statement of the overcoming power of the blood of the Lamb and of the word of the transforming faith in Jesus Christ. Some of those declaring Christ's ultimate victory with their own lips face the fury of Satan's most vicious and personal attacks against them, yet their faith is unwavering, the result of an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the heart of faith, faith's confession, based in God's word and the blood of the Lamb, whose victory has provided the eternal conquest of Satan. With Christ's victory over Satan, we see these who have maintained their confession of faith and thereby share in his victory. With their sins blotted out and their declaration of Jesus' redemptive work in their lives, they silence the attempts of the prince of darkness to intimidate God's children. His accusing voice of condemnation and guilt is swallowed up in the, uh, swallowed up in the triumph of Calvary and victory. So declare your abiding faith in the accomplished work on the cross and constantly participate in Jesus Christ's ultimate victory, overcoming Satan by the power of the cross and the steadfastness of your confession of faith in Jesus Christ's triumph. But we appreciate that there's a weapon of the blood of what Jesus Christ did for us. This passage in uh, Revelation chapter 12, which speaks of the woman, the child and the dragon, as well as Satan thrown out of heaven, gives us an indication of something that we can appreciate, that it's uh, how they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. This passage portrays Satan as cast down to earth, confronting and accusing the citizens of the kingdom of God. The primary weapon of the people of God against Satan is the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Christ the Lamb causes the people of God to prevail against the answers of all the enemy's accusations. Satan controls and defeats humankind through guilt and accusations. He is a blackmailer. However, the saints know that the blood has satisfied all the charges against them and joined them to God and provided them with every necessary provision to defeat Satan. The blood has established an, an unassailable bond between the sovereign God that uh, prevents Satan from separating the embattled Christians from God's eternal and complete resources. God has declared us righteous and victorious through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, appreciating the second part of the longing for Zion in a foreign land, we go back to Isaiah chapter 13 verses 4 to 6, which speaks of the proclamation against Babylon speaks of the, the, the kingdom of the nations and God's spiritual armies who are fighting through the, the literal nations on the earthly scene. We see that playing out today, even when those who want to come and kill, steal and destroy with their uh, satanic agendas. But we know that God, we know the beginning from the end, that God will rule and reign above it all. 
But here the judgment is against Babylon. And it's a part of God's larger plan of judgment against evil. Such prophetic judgments uh, and final um, fulfillment in this case is in the numerous activities in history, especially in the advancement of God's spiritual role through his church. A great role to play. The reference here will culminate in the consummation of Christ's kingdom here on earth, as it is on earth and, and, and in heaven, as it is on earth. But then in, even in Isaiah, in the Old Testament, it goes on to talk about the humiliation of Babylon. And Babylon could be anything from the uh, lies that we've believed, the uh, forces at play that want to uh, steal, kill and destroy, or even maybe the enemies against God's elect. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit in the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. There's another message of judgment against Babylon for idolatry here. And uh, the sorcery perhaps and even the self-indulgence. Or the arrogance. Or maybe even the cruelty against God's people. Even the elderly. You know, a couple of years ago I was really, really upset because of what was being done across the nations. And it's coming out now that these people are going to be held to account for uh, inserting uh, coercive measures that kills, steals and destroys. God comes to give life and give it abundantly. Jeremiah chapter 50 verses 14 and 15 speaks of the judgment on Babylon and Babylonia. Put yourselves in array against Babylon all around, all you who bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Shout against her all around. She has given her hand. Her foundations have fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her. As she has done, so do to her. This goes and talks about the first uh, part of this message. The psalmist proclaiming an eye for eye, uh, an eye for an eye. But here in Jeremiah, he's now talking about a hope for the return and the restoration of Israel and Judah. This is interposed on the oracle against Babylon or Babylonia. But there's a second comment about Israel's restoration, which includes a pardon, a pardon for the sins of the people. The people who are called by God's name and who shall be saved. Merathaim is a name for southern Babylonia. And Pekod is the name of a tribe. What are the Hebrew root meanings for these names? The God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He looks after those that are, are the apple of his eye. Revelation chapter 18 verses 5 to 6. It says, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render her just as she rendered to you, and repay to her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double to her. This is speaking of the fall of Babylon the Great. Gives us an indication of how they will mourn. The world that mourns Babylon's fall. To mourn is Strong's Accordance 3996. Compare nephanthe, a drug that removes grief. To grieve, lament or mourn. It's used of merchants who mourn the destruction of Babylon. The ungodly will experience sorrow at the overthrow of the worldly system. Seven voices, as I mentioned in the first part of this message, describe the fall of Babylon as, a, an, a, as an accomplished fact. Some with thanksgiving and others in dismay. But Babylon in the New Testament is a symbol of the sinful humanity and its capacity of self-delusion, ambition, sinful pride, 
even demonize depravity. Now, self-delusion could be believing the lie or believing the narrative that may be spoken of, shared, and maybe even the sinful pride that um, silenced those who were trying to bring truth, trying to bring life into a situation that was dire worldwide, especially in the days that we're living in. There's a representation of the world culture that's rebelling against God. And, you know, some say what you do is right and it's actually wrong and what you're doing wrong is actually right. But Babylon here stands in contrast to the church as a society that persecutes God's people and thus inevitably will be destroyed. There's a dispensational interpretation of Babylon that represents the satanic world system in all of its industrial, economic and godless commercialism in contrast to what last day's apostate talks about, the religious forces she symbolizes in chapter 17. But we know, even through the old, account, old Testament accounts, in this case, uh, <laughs> Hosea, wonderful account of God's everlasting covenantal love. But even through uh, the first few sections where he says, you are not my people and I'm not your God, and then going backwards and forwards, restoring, rebelling, restoring, rebelling, and saying, you are my people and I will be your God. Even nearing the end, Hosea chapter 13 verses 1 to 6 speaks of how relentless judgment on Israel is spoken about. When Ephraim spoke trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended through Baal worship, he died. Now the sin more, now they sin more and more, and have made for themselves molded images, idols for their silver according to their skill, and all of it is the work of craftsmen. And they say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves, therefore they shall be like the morning cloud, and like the early dew that passes away, like chaff blown or from the threshing floor, and like smoke from a chimney. Yet I am the Lord your God, ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no silver besides me. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. And when they had pasture, they were filled, and they were filled, and their hearts were exalted. Therefore they forgot me. Talks about how we can quite quickly forget the one true living God. No matter how long it took for the nation to realize that it had died, death had nonetheless occurred. Similarly, as for individuals, uh, sin brings death. Wages of sin is death. Though the realization of this may only be for a, a, a while after the immediate uh, realization, or may not occur immediately, but even though Israel had strayed so far, departed from the true worship of their Yahweh living God, the Lord God, it's seen in the call of the idolatrous priests to worship the calf images and the bowl by kissing them. We've got to make sure that we're getting rid of the bowls and getting rid of the uh, gods of Madoc or Murdoch or even just uh, Molech. The corruption that needs to be tainted away into history so that we can re-establish his rule and reign on this earth. But even then God knew Israel. That is, he entered into that covenantal relationship with him, characterized by not only love, but concern. But the succession of human kings from Saul onwards uh, proved a failure in representing God as their true king. I just want to speak of the word wealth grave. I will ransom them from the power of the grave and I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. A grave, word well strong as accord in 7585. The grave, the abode of the dead, and uh, the, nether, the netherworld, which is hell. This noun occurs 65 times in its broad usage to include the visible grave that houses a dead body and the abyss. The unseen world to which the soul departs in death. 
and the meaning of a grave is seen in Genesis chapter 37 verses 35 as well as 42 verses 38 and 1 Kings chapter 2 verses 6. Shehol speaks of the realm of the departed souls in such verses such as Psalms 9 verses 17, 16 verses 10, 55 verses 15 and 139 verses 8. Even in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 9 to 11. Ezekiel chapter 31 verses 5 to 7, 15 to 17 and 32 to 21. You may want to listen to it again and make notes of these. But the assumed root of Sheol is to ask or demand or require. Thus hell is a hungry, greedy devourer of humanity. It's never full or satisfied, but is always asking for more. But God's promises in the present verse is that he will save us and save his people from the power of Sheol. And that he will actually destroy Sheol in the end. God will not only release the people from the power of death and the grave. But he will also take away the threat of death. God can bring back his people from certain extinction in a land of exile as in Hosea's time. And as Paul indicates in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's read verses 12 through to 19. This is speaking of the risen Christ, our hope. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. And in fact, the dead did not rise. For if the dead did not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men the most pitiable. You know, God can save once and for all remove the sins and the abiding menace of death and it's the basis of the victory in Christ Jesus and his resurrection that gives us that victory over the troubling thoughts, the disease, or perhaps maybe the loss and the grief. But turning our attention back to Hosea, let's just see what it finishes off on and how Israel is restored at last. In 1 verses 9 in chapter 14, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all iniquity. Receive us grace, uh, gracefully, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us, and we will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods, with a small g. For in this you, have, you, the fatherless, finds mercy. And I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. And I will be like a dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree. His fragrance like Lebanon. And those who dwell under his shadow shall return. And they shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. This is speaking of the sacrifice that God desires our true repentance and our words thereof. But Isaiah uses the, 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 the series of examples from nature 
the pure simplicity of nature to show how God will restore his people. His people with fruitfulness, which is the lily, stability, which is the roots like the cedars of Lebanon, the beauty like an olive tree and the fragrance like a wine. But God himself, God himself promises to be an ever evergreen place of shelter, which is that cypress tree. And I, just, I, just, <laughs> I spoke to a brother in Christ just a couple of hours ago about how uh, when we come into right relationship and looking for a place to abide in him, it could be that cypress tree. Hosea here summarizes the message of this book. The main thing is to know God and his ways. To know God and his ways. To know God and his ways. But also to follow him and to do so by finding righteousness. And to avoid the paths that lead to destruction. So we're going to be getting into the nice beauty of this message. Which then allows us to know that as the... As the promise of that evergreen that God promises, that cypress tree, it gives us the opportunity to know that um, even through James, there's a couple of lessons that we can read and learn from. James chapter 5 verses 1 through to 6 speaks of uh, the, the rich who oppress and how they will be judged. Now when a rich person appears at the judgment seat of God, who dishonestly gained wealth. This won't be protected, but it'll be attacked. And this is the importance of wanting to do things God way, you know, God's way. Coming together and get accountability, to, to, get, to get prayer, to get accountability, to get the, the, the transparency, so that we, if we're a little bit off, we come back into his um, alignment. Whatever it is that we're doing. We don't want to be falling into this uh, account of the rich oppressors who will be judged because uh, we've already shared about Babylon and we certainly know that there are rulers out there who don't want good things happening to his creation, including his children, young or old. Let's honestly gain the wealth of wisdom through his word. And if that means that he will lavishly give us more than just the wealth of wisdom, then that's for the Lord's glory and his honor. But let's do it so that it would protect and not attack. Whether it's a ministry, whether it's a prayer, whether it's a, 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 a prayer for healing, whether it's a, a business, whether it's a congregant, whether it's a, a church, whether it's whatever you may want to fill in the gaps. Take whatever it is that you are that the Lord's placing on your heart. And ask the Lord, Lord, help me gain this wealth, not through dishonest gain, but through honest sincerity, clean hands and pure heart. By then we know the presence of the ark, as it is in the Old Testament with the cherubims and the angels' wings that cover it, will protect it even from the old into the new, bringing that restoration of Abba ben Roch into our lives and into our hearts. And into our spirits. Because that's when the Holy Spirit does his work. Now the Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord of hosts. And he is the commander. The commander of the armies of heaven. The rich oppressors are like fattened pampered animals. That are heading towards the, the day of the slaughter. Even if it is a slaughter. That some humans do to animals. The unjust rich controlled the courts through bribery or other forms of injustice and the exploitation of the poor often had legal sanctions that spoke volumes. But there's a word of encouragement as we go through these teachings of the second part of um, this message. Longing for Zion in a foreign land gives us the opportunity to be patient as well as to persevere. And James chapter 5 verses 7 to 12 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early or latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, 
for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Let me repeat that. You also be patient, no matter what you're going through. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be consumed and condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the end intended by the Lord and that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven nor on earth with any other than uh, this oath. But let your, le let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Addressing the old age question, why the righteous suffer, James reminds us that there are times in which we can do little except to be patient and to be determined not to give up. Does that mean in situations that are in our control or out of our control? Could that be a health situation, a financial situation, a relational situation, a spiritual situation? But we know that ultimately, ultimately God is sovereign. I'm going to be touching on Hebrews a little bit here, but let me just go to Hebrews chapter 11. Because I made a note for you to uh, go and have a look at Hebrews uh, chapter 11. But I'll read the first few verses because it's the, the testimonies of the prophets. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the words of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Word wealth frame Strong's Accordance 2675 to arrange, to set in order, to equip, to adjust, to complete what is lacking, to make fully ready for, repair or prepare. The word is a combination of kata, down and artios, which is complete and fitted. It is used for the disciples mending of their nets as found in Matthew chapter 4 verses 21 and for the restoration of a fallen brother. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 21, which we'll get to in a minute. You know, only by Job's suffering could he intimately know and experience and comprehend the Lord's compassionate care and merciful, loving nature that restored him to more than what he had before. As I mentioned before, how Job was restored with sons and daughters and even more. Let's go back to James. James chapter 5 verses 13 to 18 speaks of uh, needing and meeting those needs. Is anyone amongst you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone amongst you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the power of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Let's just pause there for a second. I want to go back to the beginning of that uh, passage of Scripture. Speaking of meeting specific needs. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing psalms. But is anyone amongst you sick? Call for the elders. Whether it's suffering of sickness because of loss, disease, betrayal. The initiative lies with the individual, the person who is sick or grieving. And then sending forth the elders to be able to pray for those 
who are in that situation. The officers of the church. You know, this step of faith of the sick person is trusting in for the release of the, the healing. And when the person steps forward for that healing, he is inviting Holy Spirit to bring that healing. But that anointing of oil that we spoke of earlier does not refer to the medicinal act or maybe a magic portion. But it's based on a symbolic consecration of the sick person and the joyous presence of the Holy Spirit to come and bring that healing. And in the case of the healing, in response to the obedience of the individual, it's also the faith of the elders. But James stresses God's healing through prayer. And that also accompanies the anointing that comes with it. Now the prayer of faith in Greek is literally the prayer of the faith. And that refers to the gift of the faith and the, with that of which the Holy Spirit gives. But I want to go into something here as a bit of an, a, an application and a bit of an exercise. So let's try and let's step out in faith here. Lord, I just ask that whoever is listening to this message is healed from the disease, the sickness, the grief, the loss or the betrayal that they're going through right now, Lord. We ask for that physical restoration that you'll bring to their, 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 their mind and their body, but we also ask for the, the spiritual restoration, bringing it back into alignment with Abba Ben Roch, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whatever disease, grief, betrayal, loss that they're going through, fill them up with your Holy Spirit now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So that's a bit of an exercise application in that the saving of the sickness is um, the instances as referred to in verses 15. And it says, And the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So Lord, if there's anyone who has uh, committed any sin or who is conscious of sin in their lives, we know that by your blood that you shed on the cross, you saved them from that sin. We ask that you restore them back to full health and just uh, bring them back into alignment, body, mind and spirit. So that you may be able to get the glory of that physical restoration and the forgiveness of that sin. But also for the spiritual salvation. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. The healing of the sick person would indicate the forgiveness of maybe a certain sin or sins that may have been responsible for that illness. But it's not that sickness is because of a result or the cause of a sin. But in some cases, this could be the connection. So it's important for us to exercise these prayers. And uh, this is going back to our teachings on spiritual gifts and the, uni uh, the unity and the, the diversity in the spiritual gifts. I want to make that clear. It's the spiritual unity and diversity. It's not the unity and diversity of deciding if you want to be more than a male or a female because you are born either a male or a female. Here we are talking about the Holy Spirit's gifts that are gifted to those who call upon his name and who shall be saved. The gifts of the Holy Spirit is a kingdom dynamic. It gives us the oper operations of God's power and ministry. Spiritual gifts are portions of God's grace. They display the personal, powerful presence of the Holy Spirit and are given to every believer for the common good of the church. Though we vary in what seems to be each other's uh, or each believer's dominant gifting from God's creative work in us, the Holy Spirit will give us whatever is needed for that time, for that season, or even for that moment to minister to distinct circumstances. He distributes these freely and readily at the moment of need in order to enable the believer's ministry in Jesus' name. But the spiritual gifts are not badges of honor or signs of spiritual maturity. They are not earned. Our attitude concerning the gifts are to be willing, available, good-hearted good friends of Jesus. We are to be compassionate friends of those in need. Confident on, of God's promises as the powerful gifts to serve such needs. That's that uh, reconciliation and restoration. 
reconciliation and restoration is a huge thing. Eternally it's between us and our Abba Father, through His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And then it could be with those that um, we may have wronged, or if they have wronged us, we've got to release them freely. 70 times 7 is what Jesus spoke about. Maybe you won't get that apology of being wronged. Don't let that stop your healing journey. Do what you can to restore the relationship, but if you can't, know that it's by your prayer and intercession that you can leave it in the Lord's hands. Now, having spoken of the place of prayer in regards to sickness, James offers a summarizing um, a summarizing passage that illustrates the power of prayer. Trespass that James has uh, in mind may be those of the sick person that's being prayed over, which could have been the root of the sickness, but as I mentioned before, it could be from any other reason. It could be anything that uh, causes believers or non-believers to come into a place of disease, whether internally uh, or externally. Remember Edom? Edom and those in bitterness against her? How they both suffered and the Lord God wanted them all to come under to the under the rulership of the one true living God, Abba Father, His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, for the restoration redemptive plan that He had for all humankind. Let's take that into our relationships, maybe with our own brothers and sisters. Pray for them. Ask that the Lord will reveal to them the wonders and the mystery of His divine purpose and His will. But re reconciliation and restoration is, is, is the will of the Father. You know, James doesn't enjoy a public confession of uh, all sins without uh, discernment, whatever, but also to know that when one confesses its sin, it should be confessed before the church if it has hurt the church. But James here especially refers to confessing sins of the individuals who injured them. Uh, but as we know that sometimes that doesn't happen. Or don't, we don't have an opportunity for that to happen. There's a place for confidential confession. Uh, confidential confession to the godly intercessors that are placed in our lives. And those who will bring prayer forward. Even for the offender. And also a way to provide counsel. But James stresses something here, is that the effectual nature of the fervent prayer avails much. And that's of the righteous man or woman. Restoring the wrong and bringing hope where there was once hopelessness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have joined this journey in our way that we can uh, attain the eternal inheritance. And sometimes the misinterpretation, the misunderstanding... Or perhaps maybe the unspoken word or the apology that never came or had an opportunity to be given. Know that an effective prayer slash intercession is characterized by earnestness, fervency as well as an energy to release the results. This is an eternal message because sometimes, as we do find in families, you know, harsh words are spoken. Lives are broken. But crossing the bridge of love, we understand that um, the bridge of love is that restorative love that God has for each and every single one of his children. This is the New Testament divine healing covenant. That's spoken of in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. Just as Exodus in chapter 15, verses 26 is called the Old Testament Divine Healing Covenant, James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18 is viewed as the New Testament Divine Healing Covenant. The inspired apostle affirms that those sick persons whom the elders of the church anoint with oil and for whom they pray will be healed. Some critics of healing for today contend that oil was a medicinal remedy with which the sick were to be massaged. 
but it is a, it's a, it, but it is clear the oil is intended as a symbol for the work of the Holy Spirit, who is uh, present to glorify Jesus in the healing works. The text plainly states that the Lord and not the oil will raise him up. But this practice was probably intended to be a sacrament, even as baptism as the Lord's Supper are continually observed today. This should not be con uh, uh, confused with the last rites of someone who's going to be, go home to be with the Lord, which some Christians observe when no recovery is possible. But here is an abiding healing covenant to be healed or held as such as, a pract uh, as practiced today. The sick are to, be, to exercise faith in calling for the elders, that is, for pastoral leadership. And number two, the confession of sins and hard preparation are important since our physical well-being is never separated or made primary above our spiritual health. And healing may come as a result of corporate, group, or even personal prayer. But the anointing with oil is not a superstitious exercise, but a prophetic action declaring the present dependence upon the anointed one, which is Christ Jesus. That's Jesus who brings the power and his ministry by the present work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. I just want to go through a little bit later on where it goes and talks about a few things. Let's read verses 17 again. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain from the land for three years and six months. And as he prayed again, the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That goes into that kingdom dynamic about the new covenant and the New Testament divine healing opportunities available for us all. You know, in spite of his greatness, Elijah was subject to the same feelings and uh, liable to the same weaknesses that we will experience. But the effective fervent prayer of a righteous avails much. That's the miracle producing prayer that is not limited to a certain few, but it's available for all. Including the apostles and the prophets. But all believers can pray for any, anyone, each other, and this is exercised through the church. With the same results, bringing about the prophetic New Testament opportunities available through prayer, healing, miracles. And also the end of the drought as found in 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 1 and uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 41 to 46. So you can see the importance and the, the great dynamics between the Old Testament covenant uh, prophetic uh, voices as well as the New Testament opportunities available for us. Because if we're grounded and, and rooted in the Word of God, it allows us to know what went before us and the giants that uh, we can stand on, the, the shoulders of the giants that we can stand on, so that the generations now and in the future can benefit from the teachings of the Word of God, the eternal plumb line of the Word of God. And finally, bringing back the erring one. Brethren, if anyone amongst you wonders from the truth and some return, uh, turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Yeah. James turns from the discussion of the physical affliction to a spiritual sickness. Urging the restoration of the backslider. Needing that person who wandered away from the, the way, the truth and the life. As well as the truth from the word of God, the truth of the gospel. Maybe even belief or even the conduct or even both. Whether doctrinal or moral. The straying is a serious departure from the Christian way of life and uh, it's not merely a minor situation, not, not even a, a minor difference in the, a, a, a the, a theology problem or opinion or trivial um, ethical inconsistency, but it's about the truth and the error. 
they're mutually exclusive. A person either walks in God's truth or his own way. We ask that God will lead them back into his way, his truth and his life. But to cover, to cover a multitude of sins is a Hebrew idiom for the word to forgive, to overlook. And that gives us an opportunity to appreciate the salvation that's available for all, even if they don't yet believe in the one true living God. Abba Father, His Son Jesus Christ, Ben, and the Holy Spirit, Ruach. We're going to just be touching on and closing off on uh, a few things which allows us to appreciate that um, this two-part message is coming to an end and I pray that the Lord will speak to you through the warnings, through the teachings, through the prophetics of the old and the prophetic availability of the new, which includes healing, which includes healing and brings us back into right standing and relationship with our Lord God Almighty, His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, you, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are also in the body. Marriage is honorable amongst all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? A helper is Strong's Accordance 998, and it's a great word wealth. From bio, a cry for help, and theo, to run. Biothos is one who comes running when we cry for help. The word describes the Lord as poised and ready to rush to the relief of his oppressed children when they shout for his assistance. So let's conclude some directions that allow us through the teachings of Hebrews chapter 13 verses 7 through to 17. Remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, those faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Do not be carried about with various strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have no profit to those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals, those blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burnt outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. In the garden of Gethsemane. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For, he, for here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. And let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would not be profitable for you. I'm going to speak of the sacrifice of praise as a closing uh, worship. A praise-filled worship as we enter into the worship of the eternal Abba Father. It's a great kingdom dynamic. Why is uh, praising God a sacrifice? The word sacrifice, which is the Greek word for thusia, comes from the root theo, a verb meaning to kill or slaughter for a purpose. Praise often requires that we kill our pride, our fear or sloth, 
anything that threatens to diminish or interfere with our worship to the Lord. We also discover here the basis of all our praise, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by him, in him, with him, to him, and for him that we offer our sacrifice of praise to God. Praise will never be successfully hindered when we keep its focus on him. The founder and completer of our salvation, his cross, his blood, his love gift of life and forgiveness to us. Keep praise as a living sacrifice. Now that souls and the sins are covered for those who are restored. I just want to bring the opportunity for all those who want to come into a place of repentance and restoration through confession of sin. As you do so, find a brother or sister and an elder in Christ to do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close off the second message, we thank you, Jesus Christ, for your unconditional love. You get all the glory and we praise your holy name for bringing you those back into your kingdom. We love you. We praise your holy name and you get all the glory for this message. We love you and you get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.